everybody. It's still Halloween. Yay! And today I'm gonna do a review slash response to uh, Dr. Sleep, which is the sequel to The Shining. Now, I'm gonna say that Dr. Sleep is one of very few Stephen King adaptations that I actually, I dare say I actually liked better than the book. Now that's a, that is a real rarity. Um, so as we go, we'll talk about, uh, you know, the reasons why and the things that I like about it. And, um, I really quite, I mean, it's, it's just an enjoyable movie. Mostly it's got a great cast. I mean, that right there is the beginning. So the first, uh, first thing that I want to say is those the opening oh and spoiler lots of spoilers ahead and also this is going to be me talking there won't be a whole lot of uh scenes from the movie just for copyright reasons so we start out with the opening music that original bump 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 from the shining which to this day just gives me chills every time i hear it and even the <coughs> excuse me even the version that we hear in dr sleep it's it's clearly very clearly from a synthesizer not from the original uh instrument which i think was a bassoon if i'm not mistaken um my you know my knowledge of orchestral instruments isn't that strong so we start with a little kid and a scene uh showing what the you know the true true knot does they go from campground to campground they're in camper vans and rvs and they take steam what they call steam which is the life force of children or generally children because the children are more um you know more likely to have that power and not be dampening it down with alcohol or just living and whatnot and uh so straight off the bat uh i believe the actress's name is rebecca ferguson she is one of the you know just one of the great cinematic uh baddies and so there she is you can see she's gorgeous, but she's kind of menacing at the same time. Um, in the book, she was a little bit older. Um, she was m much more of a, I guess, like a sex pot kind of character, um, which is why I'm glad that they made the choices that they did in the film, too. Um, because she has this, she's, she's a classic beauty, but she's also, um, she's, she doesn't need to be really sexy. Um and that's what just makes her so menacing because when she gets angry she's she's really scary <laughs> so here she is uh playing with a kid and again it's so benign and yet so so menacing at the same time this is just one of the the she's a fantastic villain so all of the true knot are starting to show up and they're quite hungry so then we cut to uh, Danny driving around the Overlook. This is the sort of uh, the the fake Danny, the not Danny, and he wakes up in bed. Now in the book, uh, when Danny, it it actually takes place a few years after the events of the Overlook. In the film, in Doctor Sleep, uh, they they set it directly after the events of the Overlook. Although I'm not quite sure how they do that because they still said it in 1980. Um, the Overlook uh, was, I think it was over by December of 1980. So I don't know when this is exactly supposed to be. I think they, they screwed up on the dates a little bit, but we can forgive that. But in the, so in the film, he goes to the bathroom and, and there's a shape in the bathtub. But in the book, Mrs. Massey was actually sitting on the toilet and he were, he just slammed the door and refused to use it, which, you know, I mean, Miss, Mrs. Massey ever turned up in my bathroom? Yeah, I would I would run screaming for the hills. I've got my own ghost to deal with, but she's uh, nowhere near as scary. Um, and by the way, I would watch a movie about Mrs. Massey because she's kind of, she's scary and awesome too. Uh, so here we have the scene where he's talking to Dick Halloran. And by the way, I really think that if, of any Stephen King character that needs his own story, his own series, his own whatever, Dick Halloran is it. Great character. And I thought that it was really clever the way that they did this because in the novel The Shining, uh, Dick lived. In the film The Shining, they, you know, he was the first one to die. Um, 
I mean, who wasn't already dead, right? So <laughs> he, he was the first one to die and it was really unexpected and kind of annoying because he was, you know, he was the first character you get attached to. Scatman Crothers was awesome. He was so benign and genuine, uh, genuous, blah, genuine and wonderful. And then all of a sudden he gets an axe to the chest and he's gone. So frustrating. <laughs> um, so in the book, but in the book, the scene went on a lot longer and because Dick was still alive he came up for a visit and they were in Florida and he told the story about his uh, horrible uh, grandfather and he gave him an actual box not just like a mind box and showed him how to use how to use it and put the ghosts in the box when they tried to come and get him but I thought that it was really clever making Dick Haller and a ghost so you could so they sort of dovetailed the two stories together so that um, they could still pay homage to um, the events. So, so they could include the events of the book and yet still make it a, a sequel or a successor to the Kubrick version. So I, I thought that this was a really cleverly done, uh, cleverly done adaptation. Okay, so and then the lady that plays Wendy, she's... Uh, I don't know. I like her. And I think she's less of a, what was it King called? Poor Shelley Duvall, a screaming dish rag. Yeah. <laughs> she, she's got a strength to her. That's, you can see that she survived something. So, okay. So now Danny goes and captures Mrs. Massey and now he's a little bit more normal. Now the adult Danny, uh, he wakes up in bed with this vomitous girl and vomits himself, which we're not good. We're just going to fast forward past that. So again, in the book, uh, this was written in because I guess uh, Owen King, Stephen King's son, told him that there had to be a point where Danny hit bottom before he could really try to move forward and get help and know that he was he was on the same path as the old man and he just wasn't doing well. So the scene was he goes out, picks up a girl, you know, they get wasted. He wakes up in bed beside her. She's like puked and... Um, and then he's stealing money from her because she stole money from him. And her her child, who's still a toddler, uh, comes out to the, you know, comes out to see him. And he so he gets, he feels really guilty and he runs. But he leaves them coke and money, so. Now, in the book, what ended up happening with that girl, and again, there's this, the story in the movie sort of compresses it. But in the book, what ended up happening was that girl was able to sell the Coke and get some grocery money. So it kind of turned out okay. But then her, uh, her boyfriend ended up killing the kid and then she killed herself and, and then she goes to see Danny. So the, the ghost in the book does still visit him, her ghost, but it's it done in a completely different way. So snake bite Andy, uh, there's more made of her in the, in the book. And then this is Abra's birthday it seems like the scene where Abra's putting the spoons on the ceiling and, you know, Rebecca, or Rebecca, <laughs> Rose is maybe catching some whiff of something. All of these scenes don't really seem to have anything to do with what's going on, but, but they are relevant to sort of move the plot ahead and to expose what the characters are doing. So if you, if, but if, if you haven't read the book, it's not quite as certain what they're doing. So now, uh, Dan has run to New Hampshire and he joins AA and he gets a job in the hospice where he, where the cat starts, uh, going to the, the room of the old guy who's dying and there there have been a couple of news reports about this kind of thing where a cat goes into um an elderly person's room when the person's dying but you know what there's not really anything that esoteric about it when a person when a person's organs everything start to shut down uh the first, one of the first things that their body does is it starts to take away heat from the extremities. So they're very, very cold. They feel cold. Their skin's cold. Their hands are cold. Um, I know this from when my mother was dying. So the in the hospice, they will put a heating pad on the person. And the cat's really just going where the warm spot is. 
<laughs> so there's nothing really that uh, esoteric about it as much as people want there to be. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I feel like I'm explaining away the esoteric stuff while at the same time pointing out that I have an actual poltergeist of my own and ghosts are more real than I thought they were, but maybe they are, maybe they aren't, maybe there's just something else going on that I, I don't know and is just existing to annoy me, right? So who knows? Anyway, back to the story. Um, so this is where he gets his nickname, Dr. Sleep, then he starts uh, sitting with the hospice patients. Um, so they convert Snakebite Andy to become one of the True Dot. And now, uh, excuse me, and now they're looking for the boy and uh, they decide to take steam and we get the sense that, uh, we get the, the message that steam isn't what it used to be and that even when they take it, it's it's weak. Um, and I, I don't know if I s explained this at the start, but the True Knot, Rose the Hat, all these people, they're basically a kind of psychic vampire that feed on the shine, this, this idea of whether it's telepathy or, uh, Danny's shine was a mix of, of telepathy and precognition. Um, other people probably have a different kind of shine. Some people have, you know, in this particular universe, there's this idea some people have some kind of psychic powers, but for Danny, it's a mix of telepathy and precognition. And uh, a lot of these kids have um, a little bit of it. And the more powerful they are, the tastier they are for the true knot, right? So they go and they, they uh, kidnap this little boy. And one of the things, uh, two things, one was that this kid's uh, performance when he was dying was so fantastic that all the actors were absolutely creeped out and they didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome acting. Um, and the second thing that was left out of the movie that was a really, I mean, it, it was such a gotcha part of the book, but it was just great. His parents were anti-vaxxers and he was carrying around a, uh, he was carrying around the measles. So they all got the measles and that's actually how grandpa died. Not, uh, not cycling out because he didn't have enough to eat. So <laughs> that was awesome. Okay. So now, um, Abra, Abra is, uh, explaining that she sees this and she talks to Dan and they decide that they have to go and, um, go and find these people and figure out, you know, how to kill them, how to get revenge for the boy, how to find his body and have his family put, put him to rest properly. And the true knot, now, now they understand that Abra's watching them and they haven't decided if they're going to keep her or if they're going to drain her. And Dan says, no, he doesn't want to go after these people. He just wants to leave them alone. And Halloran comes to see him and tells him, you know, you can't, oh, excuse me, you can't throw that little girl to the wolves or, you know, they'll use her all up. And then he says goodbye, which is, is actually kind of sad because, I mean, it's kind of amazing that Dick is still hanging around. <laughs> and he says, you walked into my kitchen once and I'm still paying for it, so... And here's another way that I liked what they did in the movie more so than in the book. Um, Stephen King frequently does this meeting of the minds nonsense um, where two characters somehow meet in this, like, whether it's the... You know, it's the big filing cabinet in Carrie or in Dreamcatcher or, you know, the macroverse in it or whatever. The characters sort of come together and they have some kind of mental battle and they're at their best because they're in their minds, not trying to battle in the physical realm. The film version of Dr. Sleep cut out the goofiest parts of that. And I am so grateful that they did that because it was really stupid in the book. I'm sorry, it just was. <laughs> it was handled badly, it was clumsy, and it was stupid. And I hated reading that part of it. But in this, in this, they just have, uh, they have Rose kind of um, mucking around, and then Abra 
traps her mentally and then they find her and then they sort of she knows where she is right and she goes through and she finds uh, abra goes through her mind and finds some information about them so then uh we've got grandpa dying <laughs> sorry i'm just kind of fast forwarding through the movie here and now um so Dan goes to his friend Billy and says, okay, we got to go find this kid. And Billy goes right along with him. I mean, what a great friend. <laughs> I mean, if somebody came to your door at like two in the morning and said, hey, we're going to go drive to Iowa and find a kid's body. Yeah, you tell them to go away and you'd probably call the police, right? Nope, not this guy. <laughs> um, okay, so... He's, he's in the car, his friend's uh, sleeping, and so there's a really, the way that they did this was also pretty clever, because um, they, he, he and, so Dan and Billy drive to Iowa, they find the body, and then they confront the true knot, but everybody isn't there, and the true knot has set a trap for Abra so now they got to go after Abra and I think this this left out a lot of the nonsense that was in the book too like the book was back and forth and battles in the mind and you know it, it was really you know a little bit more uh back and forth but the book street or the movie streamlined places in the book where there was just a lot of blah 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 okay so so now they're trying to talk to Abra's poor dad <laughs> They brought Abra the glove so she can figure out where they are. So they go to so they go to the woods and they confront the true knot. But they've been double crossed. And uh, this is another scene I did not like at all. Um Andy Snakebutt gets into their heads and that's not very good. But then Crow Daddy dies a great death. He's <laughs> he's one of the bad guys, and he's a really good bad guy, too. Because he's he's got this kind of henchman quality. And there's a menace about him, but he's really subtle. Okay. So now we've come to basically the end of the second act. And Dan doesn't know where Abra is. And he wants to drink, but he decides not to. Good for you, Dan. Don't do it. Okay, so now he falls in, and he finds out where she is. Okay, gets into gets into Abra, talks to Dan or talks to uh, Crow, and Crow dies, and he cycles out. These guys have good deaths too. That's that's another thing I liked about the the way that the movie presents this the true knot, and now. So now everybody in the True Knot is basically dead except Rose. And so we get to the last act. Um, that's another thing too, is it does follow a pretty good, uh, follows a pretty good three part, uh, the three act structure too, if you wanted to follow uh, basic film writing, script writing, and you wanted to look at what three act structure does this movie is a pretty good example. So it is a little bit strange. <laughs> uh, Abra's mother can't get hold of her. I'm sure her mother is beside herself. She should at least, at the very least, call her mother and say, I'm safe and I will call you when we're done. <laughs> Unfortunately, her father's gone now and that's not very good. But imagine her poor mother coming home, finding her husband dead and her, her daughter gone to Colorado. Like, that's just... Terrible. Okay. So now they're driving to Colorado. And again, in the in the book, they did the same thing. But it was more of an eldritch location. It had burned flat. You know, in the book of Dr. Sleep. Because the original novel, that's what happened. Um, but they were able to just recreate it. Because the, the Kubrick version of the film the you know the hotel was still standing it was just boarded up 
Um, so we've got a nighttime version of the drive through the mountains, which is creepy as anything and uh, great. So they get to the, the overlook and Dan tells Abra to wait. Now, why they're not wearing winter coats, I don't know, because it is winter in Colorado. And, and here's my favorite line where Dan says, um, I have to wake it up. Uh, a tip of the hat to the idea that as an Eldritch location, the, the hotel is somehow, if not alive, then certainly sentient in a way and is living off the energy of both the old ghosts and the people it can rope into feed on the shining or the shine I should say so he goes through uh all the old locations and I thought this was great um because here's where they go back to the book and the first place Dan goes is the boiler now in the book the boiler was old and tricky and they had to dump it a couple times a day and if they didn't uh, and release the pressure and if Jack didn't do that then as Watson said, you and your family could wake up on the moon. <laughs> and um, they rebuilt the set perfectly. The, uh, the old hallway where their apartment was. The old shuttered doors. where uh, The door where he wrote Red Rum on the last night. Now, what I don't quite buy is that it's a luxury hotel. It pulls in quite a lot of money in the regular season. They it, they just boarded it up and never did anything with it again. That doesn't quite, I mean, did, did they not recover from the scandal? <laughs> that part's never quite, un, uh, never quite explained why they, I mean, in the book, obviously, if the place burned to the ground, you know, they can collect the insurance money and be on their way. But if it just closes and shutters there's a lot of money invested in this place and a lot of explaining somebody's going to have to do, but nobody ever quite explained that. But then again, I guess, you know, <laughs> I, I, I guess the uh, insurance adjuster for the overlook is probably not as interesting a tale. Although I do wonder if he would see the ghosts. So we have Dan sit at the bar and the bartender pouring and Here's one of the reasons that I, uh, Ewan McGregor is one of my all-time favorite actors. I, I love him. He's great. He just gets the emotion of the, the whole, uh, the whole situation. And now I've got Harry Tom or Henry Thomas playing Lloyd, the, Lloyd, the bartender, but also kind of could be Jack, kind of the red jacket. He talks about the flies, the death flies when his mother died. It's very sad. Okay, so I'm just going to fast forward through this. Uh, he has a talk with his dad and he he's able to move on because he's not his father. Okay, so now Rose is there and uh, Jack and Abra are in the hallway and they're going to confront Rose for the last time. And Rose approaches the old overlook um, and we see it again in, in a new way. Uh, we see it as a place of menace, but for Rose, this is something that it has some kind of seedy grandeur and she can, she can smell the ghost. She can, she knows what happened here and she sees the blood come down the hallway. I thought that was pretty clever. She picks up on what, what happened and then they have a confrontation Um, they have a confrontation on, on the steps. Um, oh, actually first she goes into Dan's mind where the, where all the old boxes are with all the old ghosts and they almost catch her, but they don't quite. So she pops back and then she confronts him. And she, she says that the steam gets dirty as you're, as 
grow up and that uh, she never could figure out why they didn't catch him. And there's a great confrontation. Uh, she she act, she hits him with the axe and then she takes the steam from him. This is one of the best. I love this scene where she's like, <laughs> where it's almost like orgasmic. She's taking the steam from him and uh, <laughs> and it hurts him, but she loves it. She's like, oh, you taste like whiskey. And great line. Um, so then he, then he calls on the ghosts of the Overlook and they, they eat her. They eat her steam and that's great. But unfortunately we also lose Danny to it. So Abra goes to the old, uh, room 237 where everything kind of happened in the first place. And then they have a confrontation. <laughs> Have a, they have a nice confrontation and and we also have a call back to the original ending ending of the first book which is good where the shining or the the whole hotel has taken over jack and he's chased dead he's chased danny down but danny says no um he makes jack look at him his real self and Jack is able to stop long enough for Danny to get away. And then Jack goes to the boiler room and it, uh, Danny reminds him that, yeah, the boiler's about to explode. And so this, this whole scene where Abra says, no, the first place Danny went was the, uh, the boiler room and you better take care of it. And she gets, she has enough time to get away. This is a pure callback to that. And I thought that this was pretty cleverly done, but I did not like that. Danny didn't leave like he had enough time to get out <laughs> but he decided to stay and sacrifice himself so I don't know if it's so the overlook would never hurt anybody again or if you know he just had had enough or or what have you so I I didn't like this ending because in the book he did survive um and then and then I guess I don't know maybe somebody called 911 or something because there are people on their way I just don't know how it is that Abra got out I, I don't remember what happened in, at the end of the book that's the one part of the book that I do, is really fuzzy um, the other thing about the other thing that they left out of the movie and I'm going to spoil the ending of the book here but I thought that it was the stupidest twist ending ever because it is, it, it's exactly the same ending as Carrie to the rage. And that was stupid. Okay. <laughs> Here's what I mean. In Carrie to the rage, the new girl is Jack, uh, Ralph White, Carrie White's father, fathered another child because he had an affair. The ending of The Shining, Abra is related to Danny because, oh, guess what? Jack had an affair in Vermont all those years ago and fathered a child. And that's a, a relation of Abra's. I don't know if it was Abra's mother or Abra's sister. I don't remember. Anyway, but anyway, yeah. So Abra is actually related because Jack had an affair. It's the exact same twist as Carrie too. And it was stupid then. And it was stupid in the book. So they left that completely out of the movie. And that's what I liked about. <laughs> that's another thing that I liked. They, they left out the stupidest plot twist ever. Uh, so now we have Danny sacrificing himself. You could have run, you asshole. But he guess, I guess he just decided not to. And, uh, and then we have an ending. And Danny comes to see Abra. And tells her that uh, he was wrong to tell her to hide or shine under a bushel. And... Uh, he goes on and then we have the song from the ending of The Shining like we did before. So that's that's Dr. Sleep and that's my uh, review of it. And it's it's if you're a fan of The Shining, whether the book or the Kubrick movie or what have you, I think it's worth a watch. I really enjoyed it. It's got a great cast. I love Ewan McGregor. I've always, I, I think he's one of my favorite actors ever. So he's always watchable. And Rosa Hatt is probably one of the best villains ever. And the young actress who plays Abra is also uh, a really 
cool and interesting presence and I love to see more uh, more things that she's in. So I hope you're reading lots of great horror. Have a great day.